What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome, bike, to the channel. Welcome, bike, to the headquarters. This is BDGE Fantasy Football. My name is Nicholas. We have actually remembered to plug our mic in today, so the audio is going to be crispy. I am actually filming at night, which is a weird change of pace for me. I almost always film in the morning or very early afternoon, but we've been slaving away at the draft guide for the last like two weeks, and it is dropping in six days. The 2020 Big Dogs Gotta Eat Fantasy Football Season Long Draft Guide drops in six days. Y'all heard that correctly. And you can literally get it for $10. $10 gets you $75 worth of stuff. MonkeyKnifeFight.com. Use the promo code BDGE when you deposit $10. Play a game on there. Bing, bang, boom. The draft guide's in the room. The season long draft guide, the rookie dynasty draft guide, Dr. Morse's injury guide. We just closed on some legit negotiations about pricing on it, but he's in. The big boy's back. Doc is back, so you don't have to listen to my fake news injury reports. Plus, you'll get $25 to play with a Monkey Knife Fight just by depositing $10 using my promo code. But y'all are not here to listen to me talk about my draft guide, although I could probably stop the video right here and I'd probably give out more value value than most fantasy football YouTube videos give you. Y'all are here for the big facts. Y'all are here for the big breakout facts today because I'm going to look at a couple guys that I think are in store for some big time breakout seasons in 2020. These aren't necessarily going to be my favorite guys to break out, but I, I want to take one from each position that I feel pretty confident we're going to see a nice little breakout from. One from the quarterback, one from the wide receiver, one from the running back, one from the tight end. If you enjoy the big facts at the end, then you should consider purchasing the draft guide. Again, monkeyknifefight.com. Use the promo code BDGE when positing $10. You get all the shit I listed before. I'm ready to roll as long as you are. Just give me a heads up. Give me like a, give me a wink or something. All right. I saw that wink. Thank you. I already have my shirt tucked in, but y'all can tuck your shirts in. Y'all should stop yelling and let's eat. Okay, with any uh, breakout video, any type of content around breakout, I feel like it should be prefaced with the fact that we're not going to be naming dudes like Kyler Murray here on the quarterback position. Like, obviously, Kyler Murray's going to have a monster year and he's going to be a breakout candidate, et cetera, et cetera. But, like, he's already fucking being drafted as if he's broken out. He's the quarterback three in ADP right now behind Lamar Jackson, Patrick Mahomes. Okay, serves no value for me to tell you that Kyler Murray is going to break out. Let's talk about some guys that are going a little bit later in drafts that I think have a lot more upside, a lot more breakout potential than peoples are realizing right now. But we got you covered because we realize that shit and then we tell you and then y'all realize it. Let's start off with the quarterback position. Let's start off with the mustache. I don't know if I'll ever go straight. I, I need my beard on my face. I think I really do. But Gardner Minshew rocks a hell of a nice mustache, all right? Gardner Minshew is a guy who came in last year, threw for a 21-6 to 6 touchdown interception ratio his rookie year, had the highest passer rating and the lowest interception total of all rookie quarterbacks last year. He set franchise rookie records in both passing yards and touchdown passes. He was a sixth round pick last year. He comes in immediately for Nick Foles and throws up what I would argue to be, given all the context around the situation he was in, being a six round pick, one of the more impressive rookie seasons at the quarterback position we've seen in in, in quite some time. I know if, if, if I'm a fan of a team and my man comes in and throws 21 touchdowns, six interceptions, I'm celebrating that shit like it's fucking... National Donut Day over here. If my rookie quarterback does that, 14 games, 12 of them as a starter. This is his stat line last year. 3,271 passing yards, 21 passing touchdowns, six interceptions, 344 yards on the ground. And I want to circle back to a tweet I put out last year, I believe it was. Of the 18 quarterbacks that have finished as a top three fantasy quarterback over the last six years. So six years, we're looking at the guys who finish as quarterback one, two, three, equates out to 18. Simple math here. I'll make it simpler for you. 67% of those that finish as top three quarterbacks over the last six years had at least three rushing touchdowns on the year. The average was four and a half. Of the remaining six that didn't have at least three rushing touchdowns, four of those six rushed for over 265 yards that season. So you're looking at only two quarterbacks, only two top three quarterbacks over the last six years didn't have at least three rushing touchdowns, didn't have at least 265 rushing yards. So I'm not saying Gardner Minshew is going to be a top three quarterback or nothing like that, but I'm saying when you are looking for upside, when you are looking for elite quarterback playing fantasy, it starts and it ends with those rushing yards. He was there, man, 344 yards on the ground. He did all this. He had this major campaign with almost no help in Jacksonville, man. He had almost nothing on the ground via the running game. 
Efficiency wise, Fournette was miserable last year. And I don't have time to talk about Leonard Fournette. Otherwise, y'all will be here all damn day. And it'll be midnight by the time I finish editing this video. This is Minshew hour right now. Jags did it with no running game. They did it with a very poor pass blocking offensive line, ranked 24th per PFF. So outside of DJ dishing Justice Chark, that's what I'm calling him from now on, dishing Justice Chark, DJ Chark, he had almost no weapons on the outside to do it with. So none of that equation, none of what I just said should compute, should fucking spit out a 21 to 6 interception ratio for a six round rookie. I want to read off some headlines for y'all. The way the fantasy community is looking at Minshew seems like a negative light. And I'm, I'm far more positive about it. And I think like if Jacksonville was half as concerned with Minshew as the fantasy community was, they wouldn't have gone the direction that they did this offseason. So I'm going to read these off. Jaguars ag agreed to terms with quarterback Nick Foles, formerly of the Eagles, on a four-year, $88 million contract. That's what the headlines read in Jacksonville newspapers on March 11, 2019. Let's fast forward. Bears acquired quarterback Nick Foles from the Jaguars in exchange for a 2024th round pick. This is what the headlines read in Jacksonville newspapers on March 18th, 2020. So one year and one week later, you hate to see it. They headed into the NFL draft. There were rumors swirling around that they were going to trade up to get their guy a quarterback. And then they don't end up drafting a quarterback until very late in the draft. And then they don't sign any of these free agents out there, Cam Newton or Jameis Winston. This is, Minshew's got the keys, man. And this is, I'm not saying that he's got the keys for the future of the franchise, but we're only talking about 2020 fantasy football. This could very well be a year where Minshew is awesome in fantasy, not amazing in real life. And then he's out of starting contention by 2021. We don't care about that. Minshew brings two very, very valuable assets to the field and to your fantasy teams. They are his rushing ability and they are his deep ball accuracy. We expect six round quarterbacks to have a lot of holes, like a lot of them. But if you're going to have holes, at least be the motherfucking Titanic. Make it a fun ride while it lasts. That's what that's what that's what Minshew does in fantasy. So Minshew's raw arm strength is definitely a concern from like a, an NFL metrics level, but it's so much more important that your quarterback is accurate, you know, 20 to 30 yards down the field than it is actually possessing the strength in your arm to get it 60 yards down the field. Like the majority of deep passes, what we deem deep passes per pro football focus or whatever the stats that we back this stuff up with, the majority of those, 95% of them are not traveling 50 to 60 yards down the field. Very, very, very few plays in the NFL ever go down there. And here's, here's the thing. Fifth highest completion rate on deep balls last year among all quarterbacks, 45.1%. He did not have a single turnover worthy throw per PFF and was their number two graded deep passer in 2019. I mean, like, what really gets me hard here is, is those is those rushing numbers again. 344 yards on 67 attempts. And what I'm most excited about, zero rushing touchdowns. His 344 yards ranked fifth among quarterbacks in 2019. All four guys ahead of him, one, played in more games than he did. Two, had at least four rushing touchdowns. Seven, four, nine, and seven. With that type of rushing volume, I'm expecting a minimum of three rushing scores from Minshew in 2020. That's going to offset any dip in passing efficiency coming down or high turnover numbers, whatever you're worried about from Minshew in fantasy. The rushing numbers are going to more than make up for it. And let's not sugarcoat this. The Jaguars are going to be a bad team. They have the single lowest win total per Vegas in 2020 at four and a half. Going to trail a lot. Stupid high passing volume is going to be coming out of Jacksonville. Come bike mode engaged. And honestly, that might turn his negative O-line pass blocking deficiency into a positive because that's going to mean a lot of scrambling for Mr. Minshew. The biggest question for me is what does this Jay Gruden, who's a new offensive coordinator there, offense look like in Jacksonville? I think he's going to be a good offensive coordinator. But my concern is, is Minshew is extremely sensitive to play action. Last year, no quarterback was more sensitive to utilizing play action than Gardner Minshew. His completion rate went up 18.9% on play action plays. Baker Mayfield was the only other quarterback to hit double digit percentage at 10.1%, so almost 9% lower. His yards per attempt, Minshew's up by 4.4, fifth highest delta in the NFL. What's even more baffling, among 37 qualified quarterbacks in 2019, Minshew's completion rate on play action passes, 76.9% ranks first overall among all NFL quarterbacks. The rate at which Jacksonville called play action passes for Minshew, 14.2%, ranks 37. Highest completion percentage on play action passes, number one, dead last on the number of play action passes at the rate 
that they actually use play action passes in Jacksonville. So I'm hoping that Jay Gruden coming in understands this and utilizes that at a higher clip. You add guys like LaVisca Chenault, their second round rookie pick. You add guys like Chris Thompson, take the pressure off of Minshew when he's not running play action. He can get the ball out quickly as opposed to DJ Chark, who was his really only good outside wide receiver who takes a, you know, he's a longer guy. He's a guy who gets downfield. Like you don't have time to get the ball to him if your pass blocking is fucking annihilating you on every play. So these guys who are better around the line of scrimmage are going to be big for Garner Minshew, who's going to be under pressure all the time. What's crazy, you talk about under pressure. Minshew had 10 touchdowns while under pressure last year. That number was tied for the single most in the NFL with Lamar Jackson, Russell Wilson, Dak Prescott, Carson Wentz, and surprisingly and sort of unsurprisingly, Sam Darnold because of the amount of times he was under pressure. But he's good under pressure too. So I'm all in on, on Minshew where he's going as your quarterback two or your streamer in one quarterback leagues. He should post similar numbers to what he did last year, prorated out to a full 16 games. So he'll flirt with like 3,800 passing yards, 20 to 25 passing touchdowns. But with way more luck in the rushing department, man, I think he's going to put up another 350 to 400 yards being under pressure all the time. And hopefully if he gets just a little bit lucky in the rushing category, we're looking at four or five, maybe even six rushing touchdowns. And that will be mwah, in your quarterback position. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Let's move over to the running backs. With this group of running backs that we have in fantasy to, to spot a breakout running back, it feels like, I mean, we had five really polarizing rookie players come into the draft this year and get drafted and ones that we think can really break out by the third year of an our, our running backs career for the most part they've already broken out and if we look at year two running backs who i could put on this list josh jacobs miles sanders they already did so i feel fucking grimy touting them as a breakout running back right now because we all know i mean miles sanders is adp is in the first round already josh jacobs is basically there as well. Then you have David Montgomery, who I think is like undervalued right now as like a fifth round pick who's going to get volume, but I'm certainly not about to peg him as a breakout. You have Devin Singletary, another good value pick, but I think with Zach Moss there and Josh Allen on the goal line, they're going to steal between 10 and 15 carries a game plus a majority of the goal line work. If we break down the rookies real quick, I mean, you have Jonathan Taylor, who's probably the, the most polarizing of the group, but again, like they've been echoing out of camp that he is going to be in a committee with Marlon Mack and Naeem Hines. I highly doubt he gets anywhere near the pass catching work to flirt with like real, real usable running back numbers. He'll probably have a few games where he pops off like 120 plus rushing yards this year. Drafting him highly is going to be a mistake because he's going to be in that Miles Sanders kind of role where it's not until week eight or week 10 where you haven't been able to use him for nine weeks until you can get him into your starting lineup. So FanDuel has Jonathan Taylor's rushing line pegged at 700 this year you add that with the fact that he's not going to contribute much in the passing game and taylor's not a guy i really expect to break out this year could be like the 105 in drafts next year but this year i have trouble getting on board with him same thing with dobbins who's going to be fighting with ingram for the goal line work with lamar jackson who doesn't dump off the ball to his running backs and then you have deandre swift who's going to be fighting with karen johnson i think deandre swift low-key is the one that getting the least hype but i feel like has the most or the highest chance of actually overtaking the starting role and getting like 65 to 70% of the touches there. So I kind of like Swift here. Cam Akers makes a lot of sense too, but they've also, like Indy and like Jonathan Taylor, have been very loud about keeping it a committee. He is definitely the most talented back there. Darrell Henderson, Malcolm Brown, just a the guy there. So Cam Akers is the most talented guy in the backfield immediately. The problem comes where like these other guys break through, right? Dobbins breaks through his committee. Taylor somehow breaks through his committee. They're in prime situations. If Akers gets through his committee, which I think he's the least likelihood of actually being in one, but if he does get through it, his situation is shitty. They have a very, very poor offensive line. They did not target their running backs at all last year. For some reason, it dumped off. They were in very, very high percentage of two tight end sets, which they were throwing to their wide receivers. They were throwing to their tight ends. Not so much to their running backs. So, so it seems like 2021 is the prime year to be drafting and or trading for all of these rookie running backs, except 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 maybe i'm cheating here but he hasn't played a snap on the damn field yet clyde edwards hilaire i think clyde steps into an immediate starting role maybe not taking like the first snap in week one but a minimum of like 14 15 touches off the rip and every running back touch in kansas city is so valuable because like one out of every 10 touches for kansas city running back is pretty much on the goal line or in a scoring opportunity starting running backs under Mahomes and I've used this stat before since Mahomes has taken over as a starting quarterback running backs on the field whoever's on the field have averaged 1.75 touchdowns per game per game and even if you don't think Clyde is a great prospect this offense makes it nearly impossible for their running back not to be extremely efficient you look at the rookie of the year odds right now it's Joe Burrow and then it's Clyde Clyde is number two at plus 500 
Very, very strong odds there to be the offensive rookie of the year. I mean, it's no coincidence that Joe Burrow named him as the best football player he's ever played with when asked. When Patrick Mahomes was asked by the Chiefs front office, who do you want us to draft here? He said Clyde Edwards Hilaire. When Andy Reid watched tape of Clyde Edwards Hilaire, he said he was Brian Westbrook, but better. And we know Westbrook had an unreal stretch of fantasy success under Andy Reid, which makes that so enticing. Will this be a committee with Damian Williams? I mean, it's possible. Damian Williams has shown glimpses of being awesome in this backfield, no doubt about it. But CH is the guy in this committee. It's not like he just happened to land in, in Kansas City. It's not like whatever running back lands in Kansas City, regardless of the draft capital, that's going to be the rookie that I want to target this year. He was the first running back off the board that happened to land in Kansas City. So I just can't imagine them not using him immediately in a big, big role. And any semi-talented player in a big role behind Patrick Mahomes is going to eat. I'm not going to be taking him in the first round, admittedly, and I'll probably be hesitant to start targeting him in that like 12 to 15 range because there are other running backs that I think I prefer. And I'm not sure he has like the top five upside because he probably will be in a bit of a committee, but the floor is super high and playing with Patrick Mahomes, he's a really good bet to score between probably 10 and 12 touchdowns this year. And you'd be fucking ecstatic to get 10 to 12 touchdowns from a wide receiver that you were picking around where Clyde Edwards will is going in draft right now. I've got a lot of wide receivers. This is this was such a loaded rookie class. It made it impossible to choose one breakout wide receiver. I wanted to do DJ Moore, but I feel like that's cheating because he went nuts last year. Although I still do feel like he's going to take not just a step up from what he did last year, but move himself into that like top five echelon of fantasy wide receivers. I like Ridley a lot too. Debo Samuel was I I wrote this. I wrote a monster write-up for Debo Samuel talking about how I was ready for him to break out in 2020, and then he goes and breaks his foot. And Dr. Jesse Morse, who I talked about earlier in the video, his injury guide, which is within the Big Dog's injury guide, monkeyknifefight.com, $10, BDGE, promo code, you'll get our season long, as well as Dr. Morse's injury guide. He had a video talking about Debo Samuel. It's not looking good for 2020. He needs a minimum of 10 weeks of rest and rehab from this broken foot. And if he comes back earlier, the numbers and the data that we have on those injuries uh, is a significant drop off from what we should expect from a player as opposed to someone who rests for like 10 to 12 weeks from this injury. And that would put him like right at the start of the season. So we'll have to keep a very close eye on Debo Samuel. If he's back, if he's healthy, I'm all in for a Debo Samuel breakout in a in a major, major way. Y'all know I love Terry McLaurin, but he broke the fuck out last year too. Let's go with, I'm not going to say Deontay Johnson. I'm not going to say Deontay Johnson. I love him. I think he's going to break out, but his ADP is starting. Everyone knows he's going to break out already. So it doesn't really bring any fucking value to you. Let's go with uh, someone who's similar to Debo Samuel, this little foot injury, Hollywood Brown. Marquise Hollywood. Hollywood Brown currently being picked at wide receiver 31. Hollywood Brown played his entire rookie season, his entire rookie year with a big ass screw in his foot, which since the season has ended has been taken out. Let's not forget that he was the first wide receiver off the board in the 2018 NFL draft by a very, very respectable Baltimore Ravens franchise who was very good at drafting while they knew he was going to have a screw in his foot for the entirety of his rookie year. He played on 59% of the team's snaps last year, but had the number six QB rating while targeted in the NFL among wide receivers, number eight in fantasy points per route run. I cannot wait to see this kid play with a healthy foot, 100% healthy. They have very, very, very little, if any, passing competition for Hollywood Brown as the alpha outside of Mark Andrews, who is a, he's a tight end. He's not on the outside. And he's someone that you're getting as your wide receiver three or four. And his week-to-week -week upside, which we saw a few times last year, is absolutely incredible. As someone you could stick into your first or second flex spot. He saw a near 19% target share as a rookie. Not healthy and playing on 59% of his snaps, of the team snaps. Sorry, I got something in my eye. That number is undoubtedly going to be closer to like 23 to 24% in terms of the target share, right? That's a 4 or 5% increase from what he did last year playing on 59% of the snap. And given the ability for him to fucking go Yahtzee at any point during the game, he's like a Deshaun Jackson type guy that you're getting to draft coming into his prime. I don't care that he might be boom or bust. As your second flex play... As someone with this type of upside, you don't need to depend on his production week over week. But the weeks that he does give you that production, the weeks that he does take an 80-yard catch to the fucking house, which he will be doing multiple times this year, 
he's going to win you that week. I'm a really big fan of Hollywood Brown. I'm a really big fan of the talent. I'm a really big fan of the way this Baltimore team just operates. And I think Lamar Jackson is going to have more volume in the passing game. I think they're going to let him release the ball a little bit more than they did last year. I mean, you look at the jumps. What I love about Lamar Jackson, man, is, is you look at the improvements he made from his rookie to his sophomore year. You That tells you just how hard this dude works in the offseason, focusing on the right things. And he's pr- improving his game, both passing wise and on the ground. He's just a very, very smart player. And man, I, ca- I cannot wait to see these two link up. So Marky Tollywood Brown, one of my favorite breakouts for the 2020 fantasy football season. Let's talk about sex, babe. B. Speaking of sex, let's talk about tight ends. I like Jonu Smith. I think he's probably the most popular breakout candidate this year. I like Dawson Knox. I'm not going to get cute here. I think it's got to be Hayden Hurst. I know it's chalky. Him and Jonah Smith, very, 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 very chalky, but the volume opportunity is just going to be too damn high in this Falcons offense. Hayden Hurst is a former first round pick. People forget that, man. The team that drafted Lamar Jackson first round, the team that drafted Hollywood Brown in the first round. Hayden Hurst, former first round pick, stuck behind Mark Andrews, one of the top three tight ends in the NFL right now, Mark Andrews. He will be within the next year or two. So he was stuck behind behind him and Hayden Hurst is a very, very underrated athletic profile, man. He's not just a guy coming into a situation that has a lot of volume open. I mean, he's got the size to play in all three downs, 6'5", 250, sub 4'7", speed, 4'6", speed, 81st percentile for weight adjusted speed score. It's what I love to see. And it's not like we have nothing to go on. Hurst actually played well last year on unlimited time. If you look at the numbers across the board, I mean, number seven in yards per target, number six in yards per pass route, catch rate was 11, his true catch rate was number six, yards per reception, number 14. So he was like pretty damn good among tight ends, albeit on a limited sample size. And most importantly, he's moving from the run heaviest offense in the NFL to the past heaviest offense in the NFL. That is not hyperbole, literally Ravens, number one in running, Falcons, number one in passing. With Austin Hooper gone, with Muhammad Sanu gone, with the Vonta Freeman gone, that is a lot of targets around the line of scrimmage and where tight ends run their route. And if Matt Ryan likes tight ends, he's going to use him. Obviously, we have the years with Tony Gonzalez back in the day where he would fucking funnel out 120 target seasons. You have Austin Hooper last year in the last couple of years. Targets per game were very, very, very high. But even guys like Jacob Tammy, man, a few years back, racking up 80 fucking targets and not even a full season with Matt Ryan. And you could say that Matt Ryan likes Hayden. You see by these Roto World blurbs, he's talking them up on Zoom sessions. They've been having private catching sessions together, you know, sessions all around, Zoom sessions, catching sessions. The chemistry is going to be there. Matt Ryan likes him. Ryan literally said, Hurst is one of the fastest and most athletic tight ends I've ever played with. I love Hurst's fit in this offense. It's an offense going into the year with the single most vacated targets on offense. A very good quarterback, going to be very, very pass heavy. They're going to have very bad defense. They're going to have a ton of shootouts. I mean, you look at the division that they're in, Tom Brady and the Bucks. You got Drew Brees in the Saints, the Carolina Panthers with Joe Brady now and their horrible, horrible offense. So a lot of high scoring games here in Atlanta. Hurst is going to get a lot of targets and this is going to be a very pass heavy offense. That's all I'm really looking for in a later round breakout ish tight end underrated athleticism for Hayden Hurst. Those are four guys I like to break out this year. I know I touched on a lot of guys. There are a lot of guys I like to break out this year. It's not just four of them, but these are four guys I wanted to kind of break down in depth and drop the big facts for y'all. Again, I echo, we've been working nonstop, nonstop. That's why it's nine o'clock and I'm dropping this video or I'm recording this video. I'm going to edit it for the next hour or so because of the damn draft guide. I love the draft guide and I love releasing it to y'all. I'm a little bit nervous about it as I always am before we get a little product drop going, but y'all always show really, really, really good support with it. And you guys seem to enjoy it. It's got all the top sleepers and undervalued picks for 2020 fantasy football. It's got our top busts. Your do not, the official do not draft list for big dogs this year must draft players round by round. It's going to have the big dogs Bible, which is a comprehensive list of all the shit that y'all need to know going into your drafts, exactly how to attack your fantasy draft. It's got our rank standard full ppr half ppr fucking everything updated throughout the summer updated daily in real time available on the phone available on the tablet available on the laptop or desktop i tell you i, I, I don't know what to tell you this is the number one fucking product in fantasy football right now you gotta get it gotta get it through monkey knife fight monkeyknifefight.com use promo code bdge when you deposit ten dollars and play a game on there You'll get all this shit for free. Plus $25 to play with a monkey knife fight. If you're in a state that's not eligible, you're going to have to cop a guide through bigdogsdraftguide.com. That's all I got for y'all today. Make sure you hit that thumbs up button if you enjoyed. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you are new. We're doing fantasy football five days a week. We ain't never sleeped over here. I'll sleep when I'm alive.